baseline. <laughs> Dr. Coswell has asked to actually have two weeks in a row. Uh, he felt like we needed a baseline firearms lecture, and then next week we'll be doing um, a more in-depth ballistics lecture. So uh, we'll get started. Thank you. And in point of fact, uh, two weeks is nowhere near enough. So um, this is going to be a really high speed, high altitude overview, just enough to get you in trouble. Um, but the good news is you can always call me at the ME office. So we'll try and, and uh, go from there. Um, nope. Which one am I pushing wrong? I'll just push this one. There we go. Because this doesn't have any real good pictures of gunshot wounds, this is your baseline thing. So in everything, we have to start with a little tiny bit of history. And this is the little tiny bit of history. I promise we won't, I won't kill you death by PowerPoint on this. Basically, the real issues are, and that's not working either. Where's my pointer? Do I have one? Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I will promise to try to give it back to you. Um, thank you. Gunpowder is really old, and it's not until the 1600s to 1800s that we start seeing real progress in firearms design. The real thing came about in the 1800s, and then at the end of the 1800s, when smokeless powder was invented. So there's black powder, which is old, and smokeless powder, which is everything you're going to see now, with very, very, very rare exceptions. Basically, everything stayed the same until we got into the World War II and pre-World War II era. That's when there was this big burst of expanded designs, of course, uh, and nothing much has changed since then. So we started out in the 1300s. The very first depiction of an actual firearm is this odd vase-shaped thing firing an arrow-shaped thing at a castle gate. That's the best we can do for old stuff. But realistically, firearms started out as basically a tube on a stick. And you put some black powder, at that time it was just called gunpowder, you put gunpowder into it, you follow it with a wad and some projectile, which could be a rock or it could actually be uh, cast to that design. So basically, these are modern representations, and you have a cannon on a stick. As you can see here, aiming and firing this thing was kind of haphazard because you got this slow match, this smoking cord of uh, basically cord soaked in saltpeter or potassium nitrate, which would smolder. You would touch that to the touch hole, which would then set off the powder with a bang. Obviously, you can't aim it very well. It's not a huge amount of power, but it worked. To make it easier to aim, the trigger was invented. And as you can see early on, it was just a simple lever to hold that slow match to get that slow match to the touch hole. And again, a nice modern one. And doing the, the old uh, modern or the rep modern representations of old stuff like these handguns is pretty cool, pretty cool and pretty fun. With that trigger, the improvement of, of trigger mechanism came about with the arquebus, which, as you can see, held that slow match in a what was called a serpentine and had a priming pan. So you didn't have to try to touch a touch hole anymore. You had a little pan of powder next to it. This allowed you to actually aim the damn thing so you could point it more accurately. And with that came about, this is a modern trigger and sear, but the basics are the same. Here's a sear, which is basically a lever, which holds the striker. And the trigger, which is also basically a lever, pushes up on the sear against the spring to release the striker or the hammer. That's how a hammer trigger and sear or striker trigger and sear work. Works the same way on everything today. That's the basics. Once you've got that down, you can improve your ignition system. Then we go to the flintlock, where we have that pan of powder here. Now we have a cover over that pan, which also has a striking surface on it. So when you pull the trigger, the cock goes forward, 
the flint hits the striking surface and showers sparks down into the pan and that goes through the touch hole there which fires the charge. And you've heard the expression going off at half cock. This is what they're talking about when the, uh, the cock is only halfway back, it hits the pan but without enough force to create the sparks to fire the gun. So going off at half cock is one of those expressions that dates back to the well, 16, 1700s. In order to make the ignition system more reliable, because obviously a pan of powder with a little cover on it is not very rainproof, developments in the late 18, mid to late 1800s gave us the percussion cap. And here you can see there's basically a nipple on a drum that is struck by the hammer and hits these caps. These are different size caps which contains usually fulminated mercury or something to create a spark that then travels into the powder chamber in the gun, which then fires the ball. These are all muzzle loading things. Now, originally to make loading faster, cartridges were developed. These were powder in the bullet. The powder is wrapped up in the, in the paper sack. Um, and you would have your separate ignition, either the flint lock or the percussion lock, which we've just seen. You tear the end off the paper, you dump the powder down the muzzle, you, and then you shove paper and projectile, whether it's pointed or, or round, down the muzzle against the powder, prime it, and fire it. Sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but it was a lot faster than what it used to be pouring loose powder. Well, once you've got paper cartridges like this, to make them even more rainproof, you can go to a metallic cartridge like this, which is copper. And once you've done that by incorporating the percussion cap into your cartridge, in this case in the rim, you can actually make a modern metallic cartridge. And that's basically how things developed in the late 1800s. Modern metallic cartridges then allowed breech loading. So no longer do you have to stand up, pour powder down the barrel, ram powder and ball home, prime and shoot. Now you can just continue to lie down so you don't get hit by the incoming fire. Open the back end of your rifle, shove a cartridge in, and fire it. This all took place right in the mid-1800s and totally changed warfare uh, because you could have a consistent uh, amount of fire going without risking standing up to reload. So your modern cartridge has your case, a bullet, gunpowder, and a primer. Four things to a cartridge. These are they in a section thing. Powder here, the bullet has a jacket on it, and the primer is either going to be a center fire primer where you have the dent of the firing pin in the middle, the center, or a rim fire primer where you have the dent at the rim of the cartridge case because the priming compound is actually in the rim itself. You're only going to see this in the 22 rim fire, 22 long rifle, the, the small stuff uh, that you're going to shoot today. Now, note of nomenclature, please God, these are cartridges. Note that they all have bullets and cartridge cases. Mm -hmm. These are bullets. A bullet is not a cartridge. A bullet is what comes out of the barrel. Long skinny bullets tend to be rifle bullets. Short fat bullets tend to be pistol bullets. So this conflation is ubiquitous. You hear it everywhere, including news organizations. You even see it where people are creating things like this where you have some sort of cartridge rocket propelled or something flying out of the barrel of a gun. No, it's just the bullet. So this is an obvious Reuters lie because unless the ammo fairy came and visited, which would be awesome, send them to my house, um, this is obviously fake. So in modern lexicon, we have a pew. And this is what's in a pew. Here we see the anvil of the primer, which is what the firing pin crushes the priming compound against. So 
So how does it work now with a modern cartridge? Well, first you have to put the cartridge into the chamber and you have to close the, the chamber behind it, which you do by moving the bolt forward. Here's the firing pin. We got the primer and the powder. It's ready to go. Next, we release the firing pin with that sear configuration, either releasing a hammer or releasing this striker, the, the spring-loaded firing pin, which strikes the primer, which ignites the powder, which sends the bullet out of the muzzle of the gun. So only that part, that's the bullet, that's the cartridge case. Now we can divide modern firearms, these are cartridge firearms, metallic cartridge firearms, basically in a number of ways. The easiest way in my mind is to divide them into long guns and short guns, or handguns. And the long guns, obviously, two hands, shoulder stock. That's what, that's what ATF defines as a long gun. They can be either smooth bore, which are shotguns, or rifled, which are rifles and carbines. We'll get to that a little bit later. The short guns do not have a shoulder stock. They're meant to be held and fired with just the hand. They all, at least in this country, have a rifled barrel. That's a, a federal regulation. We won't get into that. We don't have time. But those are divided into pistols and revolvers. And note this thing on low-power cartridge. Handguns fire low-power cartridges. Even, you know, 44 Magnum's the most powerful handgun in the world, blah, 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 blah. Compared to a rifle, it is still underpowered. So even the most powerful handguns do not have the same power as rifles. We'll get into that next week. We can also divide firearms by their type of action. Single shots versus repeating guns. With a single shot, it's exactly what it sounds like. You fire a shot, you open it up, you stick another cartridge in, you close the action, you fire a shot, you open it up, etc. With repeaters, it had, they all have some sort of magazine. So you can fire a shot, cycle the action, and it feeds another cartridge from this magazine for you. And repeaters can either be manually operated or operated by the gun itself. But they're all going to have some sort of a magazine, and you can either have the manual or the, uh, the self-loading semi-automatic thing. Self-loading is a British. the work for you so that you don't have to stop and manipulate the action. It does it for you and it automatically reloads the, the chamber so you can shoot again. We can also divide repeaters by the action type. The very simple low power cartridge design is blowback. It's just inertia and it's the bolt is or the, whatever closes the action is blown back by the pressure of the firing cartridge. When you get to higher power stuff, even the heaviest bolt, because you need to close it by inertia, is not strong enough. So you have to have some sort of a locking mechanism where you hold the action closed until you want to open it. Now you can either do that manually or semi-automatically, but you have to hold it closed. You either have locking lugs rotating into the recesses of the receiver, or you can have a hinge, or you can have what are called blocks, uh, falling blocks, rising blocks, uh, rotating blocks. There's a number of different ways, but basically it's a block of steel that closes the back of that chamber with a cartridge in it, so you can use a much higher power cartridge. Now, diagrammatically, a blowback action, we have the cartridge here, the barrel, here's the bullet. You have some weight in the bolt here. When you fire it, the bolt starts, the inertia of the bolt holds the action closed until the bullet is well on its way, typically out or almost out of the barrel. And so there's a little bit of engineering going on with making bolt weight sufficient for the, the cartridge power. The spring really does very little to hold the action closed. We're mostly dealing with the inertia of the bolt weight. 
with the inertia, though, given to it, it's thrown back against the spring far enough to drag that cartridge with it, or cartridge case with it, by the extractor, and we're not going to get into extractors and ejectors, but it, it has an extractor that pulls the cartridge case back out and an ejector that kicks it out of the gun to clear the gun for the next cartridge to come in. Now, if we want to lock, and we have to with a more powerful gun, if we want to lock that action, we have to use some kind of locking system. All of them depend on some kind of cam action. So in the modern, typical recoil-operated pistol that's going to comprise the majority of the gun turret wounds that you're going to see, it works like this. You have a camming surface here, an angled lug and an angled portion on the bottom of the barrel. You have a locking lug up here where, in this case, it locks into the slide, the part that goes back and forth and you have a recoil spring. Here's our cartridge sitting in the chamber. We fire the cartridge. Notice that everything is still locked together. We still have the, the chamber locked into the, the slide, and we still have our angled recoil lug here. We move along. The, uh, the bullet has moved almost out of the muzzle, and the whole slide and barrel are moving backward together. By doing that, this angled camming surface on the barrel, the bottom of the barrel, it's called the barrel lug or the recoil lug, hits this surface here, which is fixed to the lower part of the gun. That cams down the barrel, which then unlocks the edge of it from the slide, which continues backward by inertia. Because it has an extractor and an ejector, it continues to carry, it continues backwards and carries that cartridge case out of the chamber. The ejector kicks it out of the side of the slide, and then this recoil spring, which is now compressed, pushes the slide back forward away from the locking uh, lug, or away from the camming lug here, and the slide goes forward, the barrel locks back up. So that's how a recoil-operated gun works. By It's got a camming surface, and there's always some sort of locking lug. Now, if we get to gas-operated guns, which is going to be mostly rifles, you're not going to see very many pistols. There are a few, but there are not very many pistols that are gas-operated. Here we still have our bolt, and we have a camming surface up here, and we have our locking lugs here that stick out. But we also have a gas port some distance down the barrel in a piston, which may be in two pieces or one piece, but it goes back to what's called the bolt carrier. The bolt carrier has a camming surface on it that mates with this camming surface on the bolt. So we fire the gun, the, the, the barrel is full of the gas, the gas goes out the gas port and pushes the gas piston back. As it pushes it back, your camming surface rotates the bolt so that the locking lugs are now free, and it comes back, again, extracting and ejecting the cartridge case, and under the spring pressure, the carrier and the bolt will get pushed forward. The bolt will then strip another cartridge out of the magazine here and chamber it and be ready to fire. So basically, they all work the same. It's just some use gas, some use recoil, uh, momentum, basically, but that's the, the action, the cycling action. To show the camming surface, this is actually the bolt. Here's the bolt and the bolt carrier from a modern-day AR-15. This hole fits the cam pin. You can see the camming surface here in the bolt. If we look at the opposite side, here's where the cam pin sits. Here's the camming surface. So as the bolt carrier here this is the carrier, goes back under the influence of the gas. The cam pin stays where it is and is cammed sideways, which then rotates the bolt and releases the locking lugs from the receiver or from the back of the barrel. Same sort of camming action goes back all the way to, this is a World War II era Garand rifle, 
and we have a camming surface on what's called the operating rod. Here you can actually see one of the locking lugs against its abutment in the receiver. And here's the other locking lug. So as this operating rod, again, the gas pushes it back. As this operating rod comes back, this camming surface lifts that bolt, which then lifts or pushes that bolt down, or lug rather, not bolt, creating the uh, rotation of the entire bolt, which then unlocks it, releases it, extracts the cartridge, and ejects it. Before we go any further, any questions on that? I didn't think so. It's a matter of milliseconds. Um, you can get a, a lot of high-speed video, YouTube, and all those that actually show you this. Uh, I'm not adept enough at computerization to actually show you a little movie, but there's plenty of uh, GIF files and actual high-speed video to show how all this works, but it's on the order of a few milliseconds. Uh, there's only a few people on the planet who can outrun the cycling of a semi-auto. Moving on to uh, the actual types of long guns, the first one we're going to talk about is shotguns, and you've already read all this because you can read faster than I can. But these are the basic types. All shotguns that are going to be classed simply as shotguns have to have an 18-inch barrel. That's a federal law. It has nothing to do with function. It's just that's the law. In action type, they can be single shots, which are almost always break action or hinge action. These are cheap. They're readily available. Every farm has got one. They're for rodents and pest control and coyotes if you live out west. Um, these are essentially the, the standard tool of a homesteader for centuries. And they're very, very simple. There's a big locking lug under the, the barrel. Here's the extractor ejector. So essentially you press the lever, hinge it open, shove a cartridge in, or a shell because it's a shotgun, swing it closed, cock the hammer, and shoot it. And then you press the lever, hinge it open, it kicks out the empty shell, stick another one in, close it, and shoot it. So they're not high speed, a lot of, of shots being fired, but they're simple and they're very basic and they're, they're easy tools to manage. If we want a few more rounds, we could use the over-under design, which has two barrels, one over the other, as you would expect from over-under. And these are not very common outside of shotgun sports, like trap shooting is basically where you see a ton of over-under shotguns some of them running up to costing more than your house. So these can be extremely expensive and extremely well made. Conversely, there's the side-by-side -side shotguns, which are not commonly seen outside of game fields, but it's still the basic thing of you got two barrels, now they're side-by-side -side instead of stacked, and you push the lever to the side, you hinge them to release it, you hinge them open, shove two cartridges or shells in there, close it, this one has external hammers that you can cock and then fire each barrel. It has two triggers, one for each barrel. Um, you can use two fingers and fire them both at one time, not recommended. Uh, the recoil is fairly severe. But everyone who has one does it at least once just to see what it's like. Now when we get to repeating shotguns, these are are obviously going to have to be magazine fed because they're repeating shotguns. So almost every one of them has this tubular magazine under the barrel that looks like another barrel. But this is where all your shotgun shells live. Typically, uh, they come from the factory with a five round magazine, which stops about here. There's various extensions that can go back even out beyond the length of the barrel itself. Uh, for the shotgun games, where like three gun, where you use a lot of rounds uh, in a very quick succession. Almost every single one of them has a loading port on the bottom, and you shove shotgun shells into that loading port until it's full. When you cycle the gun, or it cycles itself, almost every one of them has this big ejection port on the side. 
and they come out to the right. There's a few that eject out of, feed from the bottom and eject out of the bottom, but those are not going to be commonly encountered. So your most common designs are these pump action or slide action shotguns. This is the classical Remington uh, 870. And these have what are called action bars that are attached to this handle that slides back and forth on the magazine, hence the name slide action. In a pumping motion, hence the name pump action. So these action bars go back into the receiver and they push back on a bolt carrier. See how we keep coming back to the bolt, bolt carrier. The bolt carrier has a camming surface on it which unlocks the bolt from an extension, this extension on top of the barrel into which the bolt actually locks. So the bolt doesn't lock into the receiver, it actually locks into the barrel. This makes it really easy to do stuff like change barrels. Because you've got one shotgun, you want to go bird hunting or dove hunting, and then it's deer season, so you need a slug barrel for deer hunting. You can't really do it effectively with that bird barrel, so you use a deer barrel. So very easy to change the barrels on these shotguns which makes them extremely popular. Now when we get to the semi-automatics, again, we have the same kind of function. These are gas, this is a gas operated, this is a recoil operated, uh, and they both again have the magazine under the barrel. These are five round magazines in both of them because they don't stick out. And both operate in the same way of having something, whether it's gas or recoil action, cam a bolt free, unlock it, and then extract and eject the cartridge or the shotgun shell. In this case, we don't, this doesn't move back and forth. You have a bolt handle here on the side of the bolt, which you can also see here, to cycle the action for the first shot. After that, it does it itself. Now, the concept there, or the, the issue of shotgun gauges seems to be difficult for some people or confusing. It goes back a couple hundred years to the size of the lead ball that the, the barrel will take. So the number of lead balls of bore diameter required to make up one pound. So a 12 gauge shotgun has the 0.73 inch bore diameter. If you have 12 lead balls, they weigh a pound. So that is 12 gauge. If you have 20 lead balls to, to weigh a pound, those lead balls are going to be 0.615 inches in diameter. So the littler the number, the bigger the hole. The only exception is the 410 shotgun, which is not appropriate to call it a 410 gauge because the 410 is actually a caliber, not a gauge. Um, and if you say it's 67 gauge, no one will know what the hell you're talking about. So just stick with 410. Now you can call a shotgun shell a cartridge, that's perfectly appropriate, and it is a cartridge. But in common parlance, it's called a shell or a shot shell. And today, almost every one of them is going to be plastic, but they're all going to have some kind of a head, the part at the back, that has a metal surface. Usually brass, but currently we're getting a lot more steel ones. And that's for the extractor to have something to grab. That's really all it's there for. Um, all of them are going to be center fire, and they use a different kind of primer than, than rifles and pistols. Um, all of them are going to contain some kind of wad, which is either going to be plastic or cardboard or fiber, and it's there to cushion the shot and keep it from deforming on the firing process, because that's pretty violent. You're accelerating from zero feet per second to 11 or 1200 feet per second in a matter of a few milliseconds, and that's, that's tough on lead spheres, so they tend to deform a little bit. They also deform a little bit going down the barrel. But basically, we're looking at three kinds of shells, the birdshot, the buckshot, and the slug. And here's where your shot lives, and it lives inside this plastic shot collar and wad combination. This is it right here. And this shot cup is to protect the shot from the barrel as it goes down the barrel, keep that from deforming. 
deformed pellets fly out of the pattern. You want a, a nice, even, rather dense pattern uh, because that's kind of the whole point of the shotgun is to put a pattern out there so you, you can hit the bird. But the primers are a little bit different, um, but basically it has the, the wad, the powder, the shot, and the body. The body is usually closed by what's called a pie crimp. <clears throat> Some have a roll crimp on them, not particularly important. Here's another um, example. These are Remington shells. You can see they have the, the brass head with the, the uh, rim on it. You got a wad here and a shot cup here. And there's some white granulated polyethylene material that you can see. Well, maybe you can see it on here, but you can certainly see it on that picture. That's called filler. It's there to cushion the shot. At close enough range, some of that filler will follow the shot into the body. So that's something to be aware of is you might have some polyethylene granular material. It comes in all colors. Uh, oddly enough, the 20 gauge granular material is black to uh, keep from confusing it with 12 gauge. And you can see you've got one piece plastic wad in the, the birdshot shells, but when we get to buckshot, we have a fiber wad and a plastic wad. So there could be two or even three kinds of wads in a single shot shell. We have, again, a nice thick fiber wad and a thinner plastic wad for the shotgun slug. The slug is a single projectile. It's not called a bullet in shotgun terms. It's called a slug. So using the word slug for a bullet is not really good use of nomenclature. A slug should be coming out of a shotgun. And this is, this is what's called a rifled slug. The rifling on it does nothing as far as spinning the slug. Some people tell you it does, but it does not. All it's there for is to provide a crushing surface if you fire that, shot, that slug through a shotgun barrel that has a choke on it or some constriction at the end, which you would commonly have with birdshot barrels. So that's all that rifling does is it provides a little bit of squish area. It con the sh because the shotgun shell is basically a very primitive kind of uh, design, although it's complex, it's still very primitive, you can stick a lot of stuff into a shotgun shell. Not only is it a large volume, but shotguns don't really care what you put through them because they're smoothbore. So you can mix and match. In this case, we have the buck and ball load. Now that was very common with muzzle loaders. Now it's available in shotgun shell configuration. And you can have different designs of slugs. And this is a very nicely effective slug, but you can see it's mostly plastic inside the, the see-through um, container and steel. And on impact, these steel prongs spread out and obviously create more damage going through whatever you're shooting. Um, they're not particularly sharp or anything, so it's not a danger when you're trying to remove it, but um, these are one of many designs for shotgun shells. Still on long guns, we'll move over to rifles, and again, they come in various flavors, single shots, repeaters. The most common repeaters are going to be your bolts, your levers, and your semis. Rifles, oddly enough, are allowed a 16-inch barrel. Don't ask me why. Let's just go back to 1934, figure that one out. Basically, shotgun shells are, are big, fat, and round, and, and long. Rifles have, generally speaking, long cases with a bottleneck to them and a long, pointy bullet. Now, oddly enough, this is the case head. This is the case body but this is the shoulder and the neck. So cartridges don't have the same anatomy that we do. The head is down there at the bottom of the body. So in the, there is no head on the neck because it's, there's a bullet there. So we have neck, shoulder, body, and then head down here. The difference between shotguns and rifles is rifling. And this is rifling. It's grooves cut in the barrel to spin the bullet to give it greater accuracy. 
And again, they come in multiple um, combinations. If you can have a rolling block, uh, the hinge single shot like the shotguns, or a falling block, basically where you lever it forward and a block of steel falls to allow you access to the chamber. So single shots don't differ very much from the shotguns. And there are lever action shotguns. Anyone who's watched Terminator 2 has seen Arnold Schwarzenegger using a Winchester lever action shotgun. And it was kind of cool because you get to flip it around and, and it looks nifty. But lever actions, again, use the same mechanism when you pull the lever down, the locking lug is attached to this piece here. Here's the locking lug. There's an extension on the lever that pulls the bolt back as the locking lugs drop out of the way. So basically, your bolt slides back and forth, and your locking lugs come up into a notch in the bottom of the bolt. And lever actions all pretty much work the same way. There's a few that have rotating bolts, but mostly it's the locking lug against the sliding bolt. And you, they come in either pistol cartridge or rifle cartridge varieties. This one happens to be chambered for pistol cartridges. For bolt actions, on the other hand, you have a turning action to unlock, a rotating thing, because the bolts are going to have a locking lug like this sticking out. And when you push the bolt forward, this bolt has been rotated. Here's the normal position. You rotate that bolt handle up, you pull it back, and when you rotate it up, you move the locking lugs out of their recesses, which then allows you to pull the bolt back. In this case, we don't have to pull the bolt up quite as much, but same thing, you pull the bolt handle up to rotate the lugs out of lock, you pull it back. It's got an extractor on the front of it with an ejector, so it extracts the case, ejects it out the side and you push the bolt forward again and turn it down to lock it, and you can shoot again. Um, very, very common in the hunting rifle field. Semi-automatics, which also exist in rifle form, can either be in a military guise, uh, whether it's semi-auto or full auto. Um, these happen to be, well, this one actually has a, a no, this doesn't have a third hole, so it's semi-auto only or in a hunting rifle guise. These go, go back to the early 1900s. This is probably the most common 22 rifle made. It's called a Ruger 1022. It is a semi-automatic rifle that operates on the blowback principle. Most 22s operate on blowback, not on any kind of locked breech except for the bolt actions. And we go all the way up to the hunting rifles, which have uh, full power cartridges. Now, if you're using full power rifle cartridges, most of them are going to be gas operated. And the gas operated ones, as you saw, you tap off some of that gas to use the, to uh, force the carrier back. In this case, you can see the magazine back here. Here's the chamber. And this hole is where this rod comes back and smacks against this which is the bolt carrier, which forces it back and cams the bolt down out of lock and carries it back to eject the cartridge and then push and push forward again under the spring pressure and load a new cartridge. Meanwhile, this gas piston under its own spring has gone back forward again. And this is simply the gas plug that fits into the front of this to hold the piston in place. Now, one of the semi-auto variants um, that you hear about commonly are assault rifles, but they really aren't, because the key thing is they've got to be select fire. And they can't be pistol. If you're really going to be pedantic about it, and you should be, you can't use pistol cartridges or full power rifle cartridges. You have to be using intermediate power cartridges, and we'll get to that in a second, with the detachable magazine of large capacity. How did this come about? Well, it's very simple, a little history lesson. I promise you no more history, but this is a little tiny one. World War II, basically. 
was the birth of it. When we start the war, the Soviets got this. They have a rifle, nice, long, heavy, bolt-action rifle. You can see the bolt handle sticking up here that fires a big, powerful cartridge, and they have a submachine gun. Very popular, uh, big 71-round drum, high cyclic rate. Everybody loved it. Heavy as a pig, but a lot of fun to shoot. It fires a pistol cartridge that happens to be bottlenecked. That's a whole different engineering thing we won't get into. We don't have time. The Germans, again, used a bolt-action rifle, very similar to this, using a big, heavy, powerful cartridge. And they also have a submachine gun firing pistol cartridges because submachine guns fire pistol cartridges. Those aren't machine guns. They're submachine guns. Real machine guns are crew-served weapons, and we're not going to get into that. We don't have time. But here's the, the fun part. When you look at the range of engagements, where do military fights happen, 90% are under 300 yards. You don't need this 1,000-yard cartridge. But the problem is only, well, less than 25% are within submachine gun range. So you get this huge gap between 100 yards and 300 yards that you need to fill. And so far, everyone had been filling it with bolt-action rifles, five-round magazines, bang, back and forth, and then fire again. You got five rounds, then you need to reload that magazine. So what if we created something that fit that middle gap with an intermediate cartridge that had more power than the submachine gun, but you could fire it on full auto. You try firing rifle cartridges on full auto. Your first round hits the target. Your second round goes about a foot above where your first round went, and everything else goes into the sky because they're too powerful to be handheld and controllable. That's why you have to use pistol cartridges in handheld controllable stuff. Or we can have the short, stubby, intermediate cartridge. Less powerful than the rifle, more powerful than the pistol. It's in the middle. Everybody thought this was a wonderful idea except Adolf Hitler who said this is a stupid idea, but they continued to work on it for two more years until they finally gave it to him and he said by this time he was all totally messed out and said wonderful idea, it will be the Sturmgewehr, which literally translates into storm rifle or assault rifle. That's where the name came from. Long and involved history lesson, but the Germans did not invent it. They simply brought it to fruition. The first one was actually a Russian design or Soviet design in 1916. But all that aside, so we went from having five-shot bolt-action rifle and a pistol-caliber submachine gun to something in the middle. This happened late war, and they didn't really have time to, to bring it to fruition. But this is the first issued assault rifle. So it's got the big magazine with bigger cartridges, more powerful, um, but and it uses a lot of stamped steel construction. Now, everyone will tell you that the Soviets stole the assault rifle idea from the Germans. And if you look at the AKs versus the, the STGs, they, they look like there's a pretty close family resemblance. There actually isn't. The guts of these are significantly different. So it is actually a different design, uh, but it is obviously has some influence on there, and there's some more history lesson in there, which we ain't going to get to. But the U.S. being the U.S., we got a lot of really cool engineering type people. So why have this heavy nine-pound AK when we can have something lighter using space-age materials? And the Armalite company developed the AR, well, first the AR-10, which used an aluminum receiver, magazine firing, uh, 30 caliber cartridges, big heavy thing. The government said, make it smaller. Give me something smaller. So they went to an intermediate cartridge, which is called a 5.56 NATO or 223 in civilian parlance, firing a 22 caliber cartridge at a much higher velocity than normal and made this thing out of aluminum. And they finally ended up selling it to the government 
the government changed its name from AR-15 to M-16. AR stands for Armalite. It doesn't stand for assault rifle or automatic rifle. It's short for Armalite, who was the original manufacturer. They sold out to Colt, and then they went on from there. So we basically have three families. We have rifle cartridges, which fire fairly heavy bullets at fairly high velocities. They've got a lot of reach, a lot of range, a lot of recoil. These are not controllable under full auto. We have pistol cartridges that are short range things, but they are controllable on full auto. Um, but they do not have anywhere near the power of these. As you can see, they're tiny little hobbits compared to the big rifle cartridge. And in the intermediate range, we have the AK cartridge and the M16 or AR-15 cartridge. This is the 762 by 39 and this is the 5.56 NATO. A sort of bastard child is the 30 caliber carbine, which actually is an awesome little rifle that we developed in World War II, kind of as a replacement for a pistol. Not quite an assault rifle, because it never, in World War II, never had the full auto capacity, but it doesn't, it also doesn't quite have the power and the range of these intermediates. So it's kind of, I should probably shove it over to right here, uh, kind of in the middle between them. But anyway, moving on to handguns. How are we doing on time? What time is it? Ten minutes? All right, we'll have to go faster through this. Moving on to handguns, same kind of thing, single shots, repeaters. With repeaters, you got pistols that could either be single action or double action, revolvers that could be single action or double action. Short fat cases, short round bullets. They can either be the single shot, tip up barrel, or double barrel derringers. Or they can be the repeaters in semi-auto or revolver flavors. Again, semi-auto is self-loading. And you can have the single action where the trigger does nothing but release the hammer. That's all it does. Double action where you can actually use the force of the trigger to cock the hammer and fire it or some sort of hybrid Glocks, uh, this happens to be a Springfield, not a Glock, um, which has a semi-cocked striker, and we don't have time to get into that. But all of these uh, are going to be magazine-fed. They're all going to have the slide that goes back and forth uh, with the locking lugs like we saw earlier that drop the barrel out of uh, lock with the slide. These are all part of the Browning design. And as you can see in this cutaway of a uh, 96 miles, or the cartridges all rest in the magazine. This one happens to have the magazine in front of the action instead of in the grip, but it's the same basic principle. Uh, these speed up sequentially from the bottom. Here we have magazine in the grip on a cutaway of a 1911. How this works is here's your trigger, here's your trigger bar, when you pull the trigger, the trigger bar pushes the sear out of contact with the hammer, which is under spring pressure. The hammer goes forward. Pretty simple, right? Slide goes back and forth, and you can release the magazine from here. So the, the guts of a semi-auto are actually relatively simple. Revolvers, on the other hand, are more complicated internally. But it's a manually operated repeater. And you can either have single action like cowboy guns where you have to cock the hammer for each shot or double action where the, the hammer can be used to, or the trigger can be used to cock the hammer. The easy way to tell the difference is where does the trigger sit in the trigger guard? If it sits toward the rear, it's a single action because it doesn't have to move much. If it sits toward the middle, it's a double action because it's going to have to move a lot. And when you load them, Single actions, they have a loading gate on the side. You put each cartridge in individually and extract it individually. Double action revolvers have a swing out cylinder where you can load all the cartridges, these are uh, snap caps, dummies, at once and extract them all at once by pushing on this rod to push out the extractor stock. These are the notches that are engaged by what's called the hand. And the hand is this little piece here that every time the hammer goes back, pushes up. And that hand rotates the cylinder. 
when it rotates enough, this bolt here, which is a, a small knob, sticks up and locks into each one of these notches. So if you ever wondered what those silly little notches are on a revolver cylinder, it's for the bolt to lock into them when you fire. Okay, so that's, that's guns, touchback on ammo. People will always ask you, hey, what caliber is that? That's not really what they mean, because if you look at caliber, all it is is bore diameter. So you don't know jack when you look at what caliber it is. So you can either say it's, give its name in hundreds or thousands of an inch, but that doesn't tell you anything. And there's a long story behind why 38 is actually 357 and 44 is actually 429 inches in diameter. And then you get the, the Russians and oh, holy crap, their 762s are all over the map as far as bore diameter. So that doesn't tell you anything. You could ask what cartridge does it shoot? And that also may not tell you anything because Back in the day, the 4570 is an ancient cartridge. It goes back to black powder times. Its original name was 4570500. 45 caliber, 70 grains of black powder, 500 grain bullet. That's a heavy, heavy, heavy bullet. And these were used for extreme long range shooting. And that would tell you something. 416 Rigby tells you nothing other than it's a 416 and Rigby invented it or the marketing department, uh, the 250 Savage actually um, didn't originally reach the 3,000 you know, feet per second. So they lowered the bullet weight just to get it up to 3,000 feet per second so they could name it the 250-3,000. Woo. Now it's just called the 250 Savage because nobody uses that bullet weight anymore because it sucks. Now, in metric terms, because stuff is a lot more organized in metric terms. Everything has a metric designation. For nine millimeter, the, the common nine millimeter, that's nine by 19. It's a nine millimeter bullet in a cartridge case that is 19 millimeters long. They don't tell you the whole length of the cartridge because with different bullet weights, it may vary. So they stick with the cartridge case length. However, when you're dealing with rifle cartridges that are bottlenecked, that still doesn't tell you a whole lot. I mean, you do have bullet diameter, which gives you an idea of what the bullet weight might be. You do have the case length, which gives you an idea of how powerful it might be. But you don't know how fat that case is. The fatter the case, the more powder you can pack into it. The more powder, the more velocity. And the more velocity, the more power. So basically, if you really want to know something about cartridges, I tell everybody, buy a reloading manual because it is separated into the cartridges. And it gives you a little short history on each cartridge, what it is, what it does, why it was invented, and what it's made for, usually two paragraphs. And you, you also get some loading data, but that will give you an idea of how much powder you put in that thing. So when somebody carelessly uses the nomenclature of Colt 45, aside from the malt liquor drink, um, you could either have the 45 Colt or the 45 ACP cartridge automatic Colt pistol, or you could have a pistol or a revolver that's chambered for either one of them, or you could have a Ruger revolver that has two cylinders and is interchangeable. So Colt 45 means nothing. So this whole cartridge thing, it is a morass, and there is no way in hell we can cover it in the allotted time or even a week. So I'm just going to leave you with this. And if you really are interested, give me a call. We can talk about it for weeks or months or buy a reloading manual, do both, whatever you want to do. So this is actually how we do it on time. Do we have time for questions? Because this is the end. This is your teaser for next week. Questions, comments, opposing uh -huh. points? Well, we thank you very much. We'll look forward to next week, okay? We're a little bit past time. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll look forward to hearing more about the effect of all these. Well, thank you. Oh, we actually have a call. Thank you. So I did it on time.